Hello. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about what we've been building for the last few months, um, which is our inference stack. Uh, but most importantly, I'm here today to talk to you about an age-old struggle. And that struggle is actually training uh, versus inference. So some of you might ask, is it really a struggle? Well, it is on a few dimensions. Um, training is mostly research. Uh, what you're building is one of something. Uh, more is better. You want more data. You want more compute, more interconnect, more of everything. Most importantly, you want fast iterations. You want to test if your IDs are working. And if they are, you know, pursue, pursue them. And for that, Python is an amazing tool. Um, on the other end, you have inference. Uh, inference is actually production. Uh, so in that realm, you know, we're building billions of something. We run these queries you know, billions of times. Everything matters. Less is better. We want less problems, less data, less compute, less everything. Uh, we want predictable latency. We want things to run exactly you know, flat latency, exactly as we anticipate them to run. And for that, mm, Python is nice, uh, but there are some, I would say, problems to it. Uh, don't, I mean, you might ask, you know, why do we need to build another framework? We have so many of them. Uh, well, the, the reason is training one. Um, and, you know, don't, don't mind, you know, don't think I'm dunking on, on Python. I love Python. I used to run it for 10 years. Uh, you know, I, I like to run my models. And, oh, what's that? Oh, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Been there. So who are we? Who are we talking to? Uh, we are AI-flavored backend engineers. We run these systems. We run them at scale. Um, and what do we want? Well, we want, first, first of all, we want to be able to run them on any accelerator. But then also we want compilation, static typing, sandboxing, you know, Kubernetes, and so on. Um, and for that, this is why we introduced ZML. So what is ZML? ZML is a stack that is built on four components, four main components. Um, the first one is ZIG as the front end, uh, MLIR as uh, the compiler interface technology, OpenXLA as the compiler ecosystem, and Bazel as the build tool and uh, orchestration. So how does these all fit together? What you have is ZIG models fed, you know, lowered to MLIR code, fed to an OpenXLA ecosystem compiler, which then can build it for CUDA, AMD, Google TPU, and so many more. All of this is orchestrated by Bazel. So let's start with the first thing. Uh, we are doing inference only. Uh, we may in the future do training, but our focus is production, uh, and we think Python actually is a great tool for that. Um, Zig is the front end. We use Zig to write the models, we use Zig to compile them. Um, the model itself is nice, but there's all sorts of code around it, integration code, normalizing code, and so on. We have zero Python in the stack. We even have a torch loader that, had, that was rebuilt from the ground up purely in Zig. So there's zero Python involved. Uh, what we want is modular code with a strong focus on maintainability. We found that in pod, what kills you is not writing the code. What kills you is maintaining the code. So this is what it looks like, um, if you can read it. <laughs> but you'll find this is pretty similar to any you know, ML framework you would use. Um, this is an MNIST model, uh, so digit recognition. Uh, you might recognize, I would say, the regular uh, operators, ReLU, etc. The important part is that you do not have to care about memory allocation. You do not, you do not have to care about low-level details. What you write feels very high level. So you say your MatMule, ReLU, and you decompose your models into its different modules. We have pretty nice feature also in terms of writing ML code in general. 
uh, one favorite of mine is called axis tagging. This is like the name tensors uh, in Torch. Uh, the idea is that you give uh, your axes uh, names, and they retain these names no matter where they end up in the tensor code. The cool thing is that it introduces semantics to the model code. Uh, it is also propagated to the IR, uh, which is then up for the uh, compiler to interpret. The net result is much, much less tensor formatting. So think of your transpose 1, 2, 1, 0, and so on, reshape, and so on. This all goes away if you use tagging. Uh, and in any case, who needs Metmule, right? When you can have dot, and you can tell the dot operator exactly how you want it to, to run. Um, so this is what it looks like. You create a shape. This is you know, one of the, uh, um, the base objects in ZML. You create a shapes. And if you change the shape, you transpose it, that W stays the same value, no matter where, where it is. Um, and, it, and in the other example, what you can see is that we're running a matrix multiplication on matrices that are in the way they are right now, not compatible. But we don't care. We just say, A, on you know, B, the second dimension is called K, and we want both of these uh, tensors to be um, multiplied by each other. So it might be a, very <laughs> a bit hard to read for you guys, but uh, this is our actual, if you look up ZML, our actual uh, self-attention uh, implementation, uh, which is, I find, to be uh, very naive, which is why I like it. Uh, but you recognize, essentially, the two dots uh, and the softmax. Um, the cool part about this is that we, we can completely remove the transpose, the reshapes, etc., and just use tagging. One key aspect of our technology is that we use the OpenXLA compiler ecosystem. Um, which turns out to be a pretty good, uh, we found to be a pretty good deal, uh, because there are so many companies that rallied behind it. So XLA is a lot of things. It's an interface, it's an IR, it's a compiler, it's a lot of things. But all these companies, in one way or another, contribute to that ecosystem, which essentially allows us to have so many uh, uh, chip support current and future. Um, so we use the... Um, XLA optimizing compiler, we have kernel fusion, uh, coalesce memory allocation, which essentially allow you to not care about memory allocation at all, uh, auto-tuning, and all of the nice features you would find uh, in an optimizing compiler and uh, an optimizing runtime. But on top of that, we built all of these things on top of a very mature and battle-tested IR. The IR we use um, is the one that runs Google. So it's very dense. It's not made for you guys to read. Uh, but this is what the IR looks like, that MNIST model compiled down to bytecode. Um, and the last part of our stack is Bazel. So with Bazel, we are actually able to leverage the last piece of the puzzle, which is the runtime and how the code is built and the thousands of things you need to do to deploy uh, your model. The first one is cross-compiling. How do you go from your MacBook to an actual deployable, uh, say, Linux Docker image? Um, also, runtime sandboxing. So if you want to build your model for, let's say, AMD Rockm, we actually download and trim AMD Rockm, or CUDA, or TPU, and whatever. Uh, the good part about it is that we are able to, down, down to the file level, uh, only take the files that you need at runtime. The net benefit is 90% size reduction. So you go from containers that would take just you know, pulling uh, about, let's say, five minutes down to 20 seconds because of that single thing, uh, which also allow you to create self-deployable archives and images and deployments. And it all goes into the same workflow. And all of that from the comfort of your MacBook or machine. Uh, and we essentially do away with that, which is how do we make sure that we couple the model with, with the runtime that's going to run it? And this is the key thing. It allows us to do more by actually working less, because we know what the CUDA version is going to be running on that machine, 
on that container. Soon, you know, we'll actually be able to sandbox the, uh, the drivers. And there are many such cases. Probably a lot of you had to deal with that. I'm sorry. And then the last piece of the puzzle is that we don't need provisioning. Because of that key aspect, MLOps is something that doesn't exist in ZML. You build, a, you build a model, it runs. That's it. You get to choose whatever runtime you want to use, if it's CUDA, uh, Rockem, and Future. Um, you build it, you run it, it works. That's the way it should be. These are like pretty nice examples I like. Um, the first one is running that MNIST uh, model I showed you earlier. Uh, on CUDA, and the second one is, let's build an archive um, of that same model running on Rockm uh, for Linux from, let's say, a MacBook machine. And the last one, which is my personal favorite, is you are actually able to build cross-accelerator binaries. So in the last case, we're building a dark, we're actually pushing a Docker image that runs on both CUDA and TPU without code change. It's the same binary. We run it, it runs. That's it. So we just came out of Stealth three weeks ago. So if you please you know, like us, that would warm our hearts. Um, we're super happy about the traction we got so far. But if you find problems, let us know. We'll fix it right away. Uh, we had also had a great uh, push, and I want to thank him again, uh, from Jan. Um, on, on the framework that was completely unsolicited, so it was a good surprise, um, but also it got us a lot of good feedback, and that was amazing. And then what's next for us? Well, what's next is we want to have more chips, more models, more modalities, more integration. And all of that we're actually going to build onto the ZML serving stack. So the idea is that we're going to build servers that we'll be able to, you'll be able to run and benefit from that technology without worrying. So you, you, you will finally have real optionality uh, on compute. So I would say try us today. Uh, we're live. Uh, this is all it takes to run models. If it's not, you know, if it doesn't work, ping me, harass me. I will fix it. Um, and thank you very much.